staff designer at Mattel. I started in 1969, worked there for 40 years. I was a car designer out of Detroit and I was looking for a job. You got into Mattel and there were airplanes flying around and executives riding bicycles down the hallways and things exploding and practical jokes every day. So it was a fantastic job. You work your way up. I mean, personally, I was glad to stay on the drawing board and, and uh, not become a, a manager or anything. In fact, I think I was a manager twice and I probably would have fired myself, but I, I was not a good manager, but I was a great car designer. So things changed through the years. There was a time that I was the only designer and I had one engineer, so technically there were two of us for like 20 years. There was no licensing. We would do any car any any time we wanted, any logo on the side of it or anything. It just kept growing and growing through the years, and now there's 40, 50 people doing the same job. But, of course, they're cranking out a lot more cars, and, and the quality and the, all the sets they do and everything are fantastic. I remember uh, when I first came in, Elliot came in and sat next to me, and we talked about designing cars. He was standing there working with me. He was a fantastic artist, and he, he had gone to school as a designer, so we had a lot to talk about, but it was a real shock to have the uh, CEO, the owner of the company, standing next to me at the, at the time. Great guy. He would wander around. He loved to see the presentations, and the story is that he was the one that when somebody shot the little car across the earth for the first time, he said, now that's a Hot Wheel, and that's how the name supposedly came. And it was his concept in the beginning, too, for Hot Wheels. All of a sudden, they just took off, and we had to hire a couple other designers to keep it going. And uh, through the years, it just kept growing and growing. When I got here at Mattel the first day, they basically said, okay, you're in charge of Hot Wheels. You get to design a car. And I thought, holy mackerel, I get to finally do a whole car. You know, I'm going to do a sports car. So I did a, a sports car with three uh, jet turbine engines in it, in it called the uh, Tri-Baby. The exciting part was seeing it actually develop into the pattern, and then we made the little parts. And when it finally came out, I got to actually have the parts in my hand and everything. So it was really exciting to do a whole car. And the cool thing about Mattel was they hired me to do hot rods and California cars. The Hot Wheels was the first cars with the big rims on them because the rims are way out of proportion for the car. And, of course, years later, everybody had to have their regular car with the big wheels on it. But I thought Hot Wheels was the one that started that. One of my favorites was a... Uh, custom a 49 Mercury. And so I said, let's do this Purple Passion as a collector car, not a kid car. And so I enclosed the rear wheels so that it looked cool with skirts on it and everything. And it really kind of proved to us there are collectors out there. And that was, the, in my version, that was the beginning of a collector series. And we've gone through and done all sorts of cars just for collectors. This was really what was fun. This car has like 130 pieces in it. and It sells for $125. And we did a whole series. This is just one of the cars. We did race cars. We did uh, all sorts of cars. But opening doors, full interior, all the parts were there. Full chassis with all the detail on it and everything. When I got to this point, I was in heaven. It was like doing a real car. My favorite car was uh, working on the Batmobile. I mean, when you're a kid growing up, you saw the Batmobile on TV, and all of a sudden I got to do it as a Hot Wheel. And uh, so I went out, we scanned the car, and we talked to George Barris, and we learned all the stories about the car and everything. It's got a computer in the trunk and all that stuff. The original car actually sold for $4 million, so we, we should have bought it maybe a few years ago ourselves. One thing that I got to do also on the side of the cars was the graphics. And you'd do flames and you'd do stripes and everything like that. One day I thought, you know what? For a business card, I'm going to make a Hot Wheel, and I'm going to put my home phone number on it. And so, you know, if I meet somebody, I just hand them a Hot Wheel, and I say, oh, yeah, give me a call someday. Well, I forgot that they were making millions of these, and uh, they were going to kids. Uh, my first phone call was uh, Christmas morning, real early in the morning, and I, a kid called and asked for Larry's towing. And I thought, where did you get this phone number? And he says, well, it's on my new Hot Wheel. I just got under the Christmas tree. And I thought, uh oh, I'm in trouble. Luckily, I didn't put my area code on it. We uh, did a Trans Am series where we did a Camaro with Jack Baldwin driving. And in a few years, we won the championship. So we were the champion of the Trans Am series. A few years later, we got into uh, doing NASCAR. And we hired Kyle Petty as our driver. And uh, luckily, I got to design the car and interviewed Kyle. And I've been to their shop and took pictures of the car to make the scale. And we made this scale, and we made a larger scale with all the detail on it and everything. We designed a toy called the Zoomit. The Zoomit was basically a gun that shot little Frisbees. And I ordered a box of these little Frisbees. I mean, the box came. There must have been 3,000 of them in this box. So I went out, and I got about six guns, and I loaded them up, and I built a thing on top where you could load even more into it. 
And I stood on top of my desk and I took these guns and I just started shooting over the whole place. And there must have been 1,500 of these Frisbees going all over everybody's department. And I just kept firing and firing and firing. And people were loaded. There were Frisbees all over the place. Practical jokes around that place were standard. You'd come in one day and all your drawing equipment would be glued to your desk or something. You know what I really miss is the the, the people coming into work was, it was a social event, you know? I mean, sure, you worked in your office and you did your job. People are very nice. Uh, you're working on toys. How can it be so bad? Back in the middle, uh, probably 80s, me and a buddy of mine said, you know, we ought to have a race. Let's, let's uh, call a model shop and tell them we're going to race across the parking lot on one Saturday. Anything goes. It's got to be uh, human-powered. Let's try it. My partner was Bob Lovejoy, and Bob Lovejoy is a very creative guy and, and a fantastic uh, designer. But he was also one of the first guys that ever did hang gliders. Bob says, look, you pull me with this hang glider, and I'll try to get off the ground a little bit, and we can beat him, no problem. The model shop came up with a go-kart, with a guy sitting in the go-kart, and they, they had a rope pulling them. So, okay, it's time to, time to do this, and Bob put big orange roller skate wheels on the bottom of his feet. So he had wheels so we could drag him. The last minute, I remember him stuffing newspapers into his chest under his shirt. And I thought, well, what, I wonder why he's doing that. Well, about halfway through the race, he tripped. And we drug him the rest of the way on his chest with this 25-foot wingspan airplane on his back. And the go-kart guys, they th had an idea. And they got marbles. And they threw marbles out. So we were slipping and sliding and everything and trying to pull this guy on his, on his airplane. The airplane came down, the go-kart won, okay. So next year we said, well, let's do it again. Okay, you guys. Well, then another department called up and said, uh, yeah, we'd like to get in on this. And another department called up, okay, let's get in on this. This started the what we called the Great Race. And the Great Race grew every year and every year. And finally, uh, probably five or six years into it, it got so big, there was TV coverage, there was magazine coverage, city blocked the streets off, there were fire engines out there, and the police department came and everything, and everybody had a, uh, a float that going up to the great race. Uh, the Barbie girls were all dressed to the hilt. Then there was a group that was a nun, a bunch of nuns. Some groups had bicycles that had 30 or 40 people on a bicycle all pedaling away with chains running every direction. Well, it got so big, we were <laughs> spending Mattel's money so much they finally put a kibosh to it. And, uh, Mattel's legacy, it's fairly easy. I mean, every kid in the world's gonna play with a Hot Wheel or a Barbie or a Zoom It or some toy. It's one of those brand names like Kleenex that uh, you're always gonna say, oh yeah, I remember that when I was a kid. It's pretty neat working for a company that is, is well-known. That's all you have to say. In my case, all I have to say is Hot Wheels, and everybody says, oh, yeah, I played with them when I was a kid. So I get a chance to uh, meet a lot of people that way. So uh, Mattel, and anybody that knows Mattel knows they make a good quality product and a fun product, and that's the main thing.